there is nothing better than a good glass of milk. Nowadays, we take the convenience of fresh milk for granted, as we can easily pick up a pint or two at the supermarket or have it traditionally delivered by the milkman. Getting fresh milk wasn't always so easy. Before the construction of the railways, milk was rarely seen as a sustainable staple of food. Milk was delivered in churns using carts from the local farms to the towns and villages nearby. There was simply no other way to transport the milk further afield without the risk of the milk souring, and the distance the milk was delivered to depended heavily on the weather. If the weather was hot, this would increase the heat in the metal churns and the milk would sour quicker. Ice and ice houses were about, but ice in the quantities that were needed were reserved mostly for the most wealthiest of families. Gradually, over time, the properties of milk as a healthy food were made apparent and dairy farms profited from the increased boom. But cities like London were suffering. 20% of the total population lived within the city, but inner city farms and dairies responsible for the city's milk production were struggling. Green pastures were being swallowed up by development and the pastures that were available were lacking nutrition from being overgrazed. Dairy cattle had become a hot pot for disease, with many farmers culling entire herds in a desperate attempt to stop the spread. The dairy business in London was collapsing and was in dire need of an overhaul. In the countryside, however, milk was plentiful and contained more nutritional value. Farmers wanted to branch into the dairy industry and knew there was a need in London. Milk had to get to the city quickly, and the quickest route at the time was by rail. The London and North Western Railway were one of the first to adopt the idea. The dairies would collate the milk together and offered the farmers contracts to take the milk to the city by rail, even paying for the carriage. Milk was collected in the usual churns and left at railway platforms to be collected by trains bound for the city while empties were left for the dairy and farms to refill again. The trains were timed at first with the cattle. Cattle must be milked twice a day, once early morning and later in the evening. Due to the lack of refrigeration, the distance the milk was carried still depended on the weather, but milk could be sent as far as 75 miles from the farm. In the new 20th century, Dairies improved greatly in its ability to keep the milk cool. Cooling rooms were developed that allowed for the milk that even missed the morning train and milk delivered in the afternoon to be stored until the next morning. These rooms were ineffective in warm weather, so while it was an improvement on having no cooling room at all, it still meant that the weather would still be playing a role. With the rising demand for milk, farmers and dairies had to think of new ways to meet the supply. Cooperatives were established to pool milk production to meet demand. Farmers that had no interest in dairy farming were finding that keeping a few dairy cows on the farm very profitable. They only had to provide a few churns a day, but those churns added up when added to the growing stockpile. To ensure freshness to the cities and towns, the churns would be added to the morning passenger runs in specially built box vans. These vans had ventilation, allowing the cool air to circulate freely. Commuters would dub the train as the milk train and it became a standard feature on a morning. By the 1930s, demand was still growing. Chocolatiers such as Cadbury and Roundtrees needed vast quantities of milk for its chocolate production. The population had swelled and the churns could not hold enough. Dairy farms were being established in areas that were less favourable due to demand, but more favourable than having them inner cities. Creameries were pooling and collecting more and more milk and more development was needed to take the milk further without having the weather being a factor. The adaption of the road and the road tanker and the inauguration of the Milk Marketing Board in 1934 encouraged farmers to allow the collection of milk from farms via the road in tankers. Thanks to the farmers not needing to deliver the milk to the stations, 
the railway lost over 40% of its milk deliveries to the roads. Even though the developments to the road transportation of milk was causing the railways to lose money, the LMS and the GWR introduced a new type of rail tanker. The tanker was specially designed for the transport of milk and was glass lined. The glass would protect the milk from the elements and allow the milk to be transported further. Because of the fragility of the tankers, they couldn't be marshalled with standard goods wagons or roughly shunted. Milk trains removed the passenger element and would be either a mix of tankers with wagons allowing for stops at stations for churns from smaller farms or fully fitted milk trains. The tankers coming and were owned by the dairies themselves. The new milk tankers though were not perfect. The tankers were not very stable due to its high centre of gravity and the way that the milk would move within it. After a derailment, a new type of tanker was developed that had a larger wheelbase and six-wheel chassis. All wagons would eventually be adapted to the new six-wheel designs and would hold over 3,000 gallons each. The new tankers enabled the LMS to dominate the milk rail industry, second only to the Great Western, and would now take milk over 300 miles across its network overnight, running at the same speed as most passenger expresses. After World War II, milk production completely exploded. Frisian cattle, specially bred for milk production, were readily available and would produce gallons of milk a day. As the roads and motorways became the norm, dairies turned from the rail to the road once again. But this time, the railway would not recover. In 1981, the Milk Marketing Board, responsible for the railway movement of milk, ceased and with it over a hundred years of tradition. Many heritage railways make tribute to the milk train by still having old milk churns at stations. Nowadays, instead of being used for milk, many have been converted into money banks, raising money for various projects or planters. The National Railway Museum also pays homage to the milk train by preserving a tanker from United Dairies, one of the LMS's dairies. It was made in 1937 in Derby in the new six-wheel arrangement. It was preserved in 1986, still in its great milk marketing board livery. While it was recovered and its age and company belonged to established, thanks to its chassis numbers and detailing, the tanker was repainted in its United Dairies livery as it would have looked when it was built. Many other tankers have also survived and are used by many railways as auxiliary water tankers, mobile fire tenders, and even line-side weed killer dispensers. The milk trains were famous and kept the population healthy and well-nourished for many years, and it was sad to see them go to the roads. Today, road tankers take almost all the milk we drink around the country, and with the tankers able to regulate the temperatures, it's a certainty that the milk you get for your cereal is the freshest it can be, with the best shelf life possible. But if you do go to the railways, keep an eye out for those milk churns on the station platform. It's an interesting reminder of what was once was as you wait for your train with your morning cup of tea.